It's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Another form of church service involved the handling of poisonous snakes, talking in unknown tongues, and sometimes drinking strychnine as a testament to one's faith. Although these services have received widespread attention and much media coverage, only a very few mountain people participated in these rituals. The basis for this sometimes deadly practice is the scriptural reference Mark 16, 17 through 18, which states, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Thou shalt lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I asked Alex if he was familiar with snake handling meetings. Oh, I've seen them handle snakes many a time. Henry Sweeney, he lives right down the road here in that log house, used to do that all the time. I've known him ever since he was born. He's up around 70 or 75 years old by now, I guess. I've seen him handle them copperheads and put them around his neck. That man could preach. It was awful to hear him preach, but now he's quit the snake handling. He's just gifted some way. He can't read nor write, but that man could preach some of the best sermons ever you heard. He'd get somebody up beside him to read for him. Now in parentheses, John Rice says, in the early summer of 1985, I received word that Henry was back handling snakes and that he had been bitten on the neck by one. The report indicated that because he had been bitten several times before his immunity was such that the last bite had little effect on him. Where did the snake handlers have their meetings? Different places. They used to have them down there in Sneedville regular. Maud Bell and her man, they took up with the holiness, and she could handle them snakes any way she wanted to, but one finally bit her. What happened? One bit her on the arm, and she liked to have died in spite of all they could do. Mutt interrupts his father on one of the rare occasions. She got bit with one later, and it killed her. Alex ignored Mutt's interjection completely. Did they have them in the church house? Yeah, they'd have them in a big box. They'd have music and hollering and finally get around to picking them up. But they never picked one of them up until they had that music playing. It drawed them snakes' attention. They'd reach in that box and bring one out. I've seen Henry lay a copperhead around his neck and stand there with it till it'd start crawling off and he'd reach up and get it. It was just as big around as my arm. It hang down both sides of him. It must have been four or five feet long. When they started the meeting, did they have a regular sermon first and singing or what? They'd sing and play the music a while. Then they'd get whoever they wanted to read the Bible for them. It was a sight to watch and hear them. They'd get in the biggest way. Lol, they'd shout and shake their head and make noises to where you couldn't understand a thing they said talk in unknown tongues, and run up to that box and grab them a snake. The music never stopped. They'd have a guitar, a fiddle, a banjo, and they'd sing. Oh, it was awful. And they talked in unknown tongues? Oh, yes, you couldn't understand a thing they said. When they jerked their heads, it looked like they'd fly off their shoulders, and them a-handling them copperheads and rattlesnakes all the time. Alex, I know that most of the people in your area hunted and trapped for the meat and for the hides and furs, but in many areas, people would get together and hunt foxes purely for the fun of getting together and for the sport of hearing the hounds run. And of course, they never tried to actually catch or kill the fox. Was there any of that type of fox hunting here? Old man Lou Trent down here, that's Margie's granddaddy, kept foxhounds all the time, and he was a terrible feller to fox hunt. He and some other men would go fox hunting at least one night every week. He'd carry a little board to set on when the ground was cold or wet. They'd find a high point on one of these ridges and build them up a fire and sit there, sometimes all night, and listen to them hounds run. They knowed whose dog was hottest on the trail by the way he barked, 
and they could tell how close the pack was to the fox. Everybody wanted his dog to be at the head of the pack, and they'd argue sometimes about whose dog was leading the others. One time, Lou run a fox all night, and it got about daylight, and we was eating breakfast, and we heard them coming round the side of the ridge. Pap run and got his pistol, and when the fox come out by the house, he shot and killed it. In a little while, here come the dogs, and of course they stopped when the scent of the fox stopped, and they's a running around everywhere all confused. In a little while, here come Lou and some more fellers inquiring about where the fox went to. By that time, Pap had him about skinned, and Lou, he got so mad. He said, damned if I'd had that fox killed for ten dollars. Oh, he was a terrible man to fox hunt. One time he took his two hounds out hunting, Lou and Loud was their names. The hounds catched a fox, and he stopped by an old lady's hut up there to warm up. At least, that's what he used as an excuse. She had two or three children lying on the ground, didn't have no floor in the house. He went in with that fox, and she asked what he'd take for it. He said, well, I'll give you the fox if you'll let me sleep with you. And she said, all right, I'll sure make a trade with you. They was just starved to death, and they skinned that fox and cooked it. What other types of sports were there? Well, they'd fight dogs, sometimes, and chickens. Right up here in the gap of the ridge, there was a level place, and people would gather there and bring their fighting roosters. They'd bring banjos and fiddles, and they'd have a hoedown along with it. A lot of mean women would come there, and they'd have a time. I asked Alex if he could think of any other activity which was engaged in mainly for the fun of it. His reply was most interesting. He said that sometimes they would serenade neighbors by plucking a tightly stretched rosin string tied to the victim's house. They called it tattooing. I was sure I misunderstood, and I had him repeat it. And again he said, tattooing. Didn't you ever hear of tattooing? Well, I couldn't imagine anything in the mountains of Hancock County resembling the maritime practice of coloring the skin. I decided that Alex was mispronouncing some other word, or that he was confused. But when I consulted Mr. Webster, I was surprised to find that tattoo once meant a call on a drum, fife, or bugle. Alex had added yet another word to my vocabulary. I asked him to explain tattooing. You take and drive a nail over the door or around the window frame of a house and tie a string to that nail and then go off into the woods and pull that string tight. Take you some English rosin and rub backwards and forwards on that tight string and it makes the awfulest racket ever you heard. Sounds like somebody's tearing the whole house down, but nobody can tell where the noise is coming from. They would serenade people after they got married, or to scare people and such as that. They'd have a lot of fun of it. They was an old feller who lived over here by the name of Uncle Boone Gibson. He lived to be 118 years old, they said. I don't know for sure, but I know he was awful old. They's a feller that come by Uncle Boone's place one day, him and his wife, and they had no place to stay. Well, they got to talking to Uncle Boone, and he felt sorry for them, and he took pity sakes on them and let them move into an old waste house he had. This feller was to cut firewood to pay for his rent. Well, after he got moved in, he'd come down to Uncle Boone's and just stay around and talk and eat, but wouldn't cut no wood much. Uncle Boone seed they wasn't nothing to him. He wouldn't work, wasn't no account. He said he'd give anything in the world to get shed of him, but he was afraid to run him off, afraid he'd come back and burn him out or something. One of his neighbors, Jerry Mullen, said, I'll tell you how to get shed of him. Tattoo him. You won't have to tell him to go. He'll go himself. Well, they fixed up that string while that feller was away, and that night, Jerry Mullins and some other men slipped up above the house to where that string was tied. They took that English rosin and commenced tattooing that feller, rubbing it back and forth. They said that made the awfulest racket ever you heard. Well, that old man run out of the house trying to find the cause of such a racket, and they slowed down. But when he went back in the house, they started up again. It liked to have scared him to death. 
he thought sure that the Hanks was after him, and the very next day, he moved out. Alex laughed. How about foot races, wrestling, and things like that? Oh, it was awful at the foot races, jumping and wrestling we used to do. Men and boys would gather somewhere on Sunday afternoon. We'd have a feller lay down and stretch out on the ground, and then we'd scratch a mark at his feet and one at his head. He'd get up and try to jump the length of his body flat-footed. Now that's harder to do than you might think. In races, I understand, people would scratch a line in the dirt and start from there. In other words, they would start from scratch. Yeah, just take a stick and scratch a line in the dirt, and that would be your starting line. Sometimes we'd have races on one foot, just hop along. We'd run races like that till we'd get so sore we couldn't walk. Boy, it was a sight to see people wrestle. We'd wrestle till we'd wear one another out, trying to see who could throw the other down and keep him there. Now, we sure had some good times back then. People didn't get together too often, but when they did, they was a lot more friendlier than they are now. They'd get together to help one another out, but you don't hear tell of that no more, not like you used to. Chapter 11 on death, burials, funerals, and coffin making. I never charged a penny for making a coffin. In January 1982, when Alex had just turned 91, I spent several hours with him in his tiny back room where he began to spend virtually all his time during the winter months. It was a bleak, windy day. He sat, as always, with his chair tilted against the bed, facing the one window which graced the room. Gary Hamilton, a Knoxville photographer, had accompanied me, and he took dozens of photographs which bothered Alex not at all. He was one of the few people I ever knew who did not, in one way or another, pose for the camera, and he was just as oblivious to the recorder. The dreary, melancholy day was, I thought, quite appropriate for the subject I wanted to discuss with him, funeral and burying customs. I was surprised the first time Alex touched on this topic. He talked of burials with no coffins and of funerals conducted months after the burial. He remembered when funeral services were not held in churches and when there were no flowers or grave decorations connected with funerals. No lettered markers were erected to denote the resting place, and the headstones were but rough, uncut rock chosen randomly on the basis of their proximity to the grave. In an endeavor to learn more about these customs, I asked several questions. Alex, I think I mentioned to you a letter I found in an old trunk in the Smoky Mountains. It was from a man whose wife had recently died, and it was addressed to a Baptist preacher asking him to come by and preach his wife's funeral sometime in the spring of the next year. I thought it was a very strange request, but you told me this was not uncommon. Oh, no. When I was growing up and somebody died, they wouldn't have no funeral when they buried them. They'd take them to the graveyard, and if there's anybody around handy, why, they'd sing a song or something, pray maybe, and put them down in the grave. Now, if they was a pretty good person, important, they'd generally have the funeral preached later on. When old George Bell's wife died, he didn't have her funeral till she'd been dead nearly a year. The people took rails and rocks to set on when they finally preached her funeral. Would the service, the funeral, be held in a church or at the cemetery? It was generally held at the person's home or out in the yard. This practice of preaching the funeral in the church, that's not been in style too long. Oh, I say they've been doing that for 25 or 30 years. I'm sure time has passed faster than Alex realized and that he was a little off the mark here. I remember the first time ever I heard of a funeral being preached in a church. I thought that was the oddest thing ever. He was a Trent, and they had the funeral right down here on Panther Creek. When Mama died, I was about grown, and by that time, people had begun to have funerals sort of like they do now, only not hardly as good. I was a staying with a preacher over on Blackwater by the name of Munsey when Mama died. I was a working for him the day she died. They come and told me she was dead and I come on home, but I went back there the next day and asked him would he come up and tend to it for me. He had a funeral sort of like they have today and people talked about it. 
I understand the practice of having flowers at the funeral and for decorating the graves wasn't carried on either. No, this flower business, you never heard that named. The first ever I knowed of having flowers about the grave was after Uncle Whit died. He was buried next to his mother right down from where Ellis lives. Then later his wife died and they was three graves there. Well, old Spade Gibson, he was a preacher that lived right out the ridge. He come down to them graves and had a service. He got out there and started gathering every wild flower he could find, and he had all the crowd gathering flowers. And them that was too small, he would give a flower so they could put it on the graves. Now that's where the flower business around here all started from. I don't know where it started elsewhere, but that's where it started in this country. That's the way things was done back then. Now, if somebody dies and they don't have $500 worth of flowers and a big expensive funeral, it's a sight to hear people talk. The Savior, you can't find where they was flowers put around him. He was just wrapped in a linen cloth and a rock rolled over him. I suppose the neighbors would dig the graves. Yeah, they didn't have no trouble getting a grave dug. Everybody pert near it would come if they knowed about it and help dig a person's grave when they died. I imagine it was hard to get enough coffins during epidemics. They died sometimes might near faster than they could put them away. I've seen people put away without any coffins. They just wrap them up in cloth, quilts, or whatever they could get and put boards over them and cover them with dirt. There's a graveyard right up the ridge here, not a half a mile, and I don't know how many folks is buried there, but I bet they ain't five people that's buried in coffins. Old Hannah Goodman died up here on the ridge, and they buried her without a sign of a coffin, just left her everyday clothes on her, cut out a place for her to lay, and buried her. Didn't have no funeral service nor nothing. I was there. Was it customary for people to have certain items buried with them? Sometimes an old person would want to be buried with his walking cane, his pocket knife, or something like that. They said the Indians would be buried with their dog, gun, and bow, but I never saw nothing like that buried with the whites. When I lived over on Blackwater, there was a feller named Lee Horton who lived right close to me. Me and him was good friends. Him and his wife took the flu, let's see, in 1918, I believe. I was up early one morning getting breakfast. Margie had just had a baby and wasn't able to do much, and I was making up enough dough to make biscuits when here come Bert Levesey. He said, I was wondering if I could get you to go up and help lay out Lee Horton. Lay out Lee, I said. Yeah, he said, Lee's dead, and I've been all up and down this creek and can't get nobody to help lay him out. They're all afraid of catching the flu and dying themselves. I said, wait a minute, and I'll sure go. I just dropped what I was doing, didn't even eat no breakfast, and struck out with him. When we got there, his wife was bad off, right at the point of death. We laid him out, me and Bert, and got him ready to be buried. He began to get cold, and we had to straighten him out. He died all humped up, drawed up. Finally, we got him straight, took two chairs, and put a plank from one to another, put a quilt under it, and got him on that, and laid him out. By the time we got him laid out, I guess, we was two hours getting him fixed. His father-in-law, he come up and another feller or two with him, but they wouldn't come in the house. They's afraid to. Me and Bert had to fix him to put him away, and they was just three of us at his burial. They said, Lord, I wouldn't have done that for nothing. If you take that, you'll sure die. I said, you don't die but once, I don't reckon. I didn't have the flu for over a year after that. Finally, I took it, but I'm still here yet. What exactly do you mean when you say, lay a person out? We'd dress them and get them ready for burying. We'd put a nickel on each eye to keep them closed. Most everybody I saw die, died with their eyes open, and if you let them get cold that way, then you could never get them closed. If you kept them coins on their eyes till they got cold, you could take them off and the eyes would stay closed. If you didn't have any coins, you could use little flat stones. I've seen that done. Now the funeral homes slip a little piece of paper under the eyelids and that keeps them closed. 
You mentioned the flu outbreak of 1917. I imagine it killed a lot of people here, just as it did across the country. Oh, it was a sight. Sometimes the whole family would be down and nobody to wait on them. There was a feller that lived across the creek from me named Charlie Mullins. They thought, sure, he would die, and they was setting up with him. He had an awful high fever, and they didn't expect him to live through the night. Along about 12 or 1 o'clock, they went to Nodden, and Charlie slipped out of the house in nothing but his underwear. He was out of his head. He come over to my house and started beating on the door and waked me. There he stood in the snow, soaking wet from wading the creek. Didn't have on no shoes, nor coat, nor nothing. Jump up right quick, he said. They're after me, and they're going to kill me. His feet was cut and bleeding, and I could see he didn't know a thing in the world. I built up a fire and got him warm. When I looked out and seen a light moving around across the creek, I knowed they's out looking for him. I hollered at them, and they brought some dry clothes and come and got him. Well, that broke his fever, and he got well. Doc Trent said later that that was all that saved his life. We hear a lot about the smallpox epidemics of pioneer times. Were there such outbreaks in your area? Oh, I'll say, Pap and Mama both had it and nearly died. One of my sisters was married and lived up in Virginia, and she and her man both took the smallpox. He was a coal miner. They didn't have nobody to take care of them, and Mother, she went up there to help them out. When well, a few days, she come down with the smallpox, too. And Pap went up there and helped out for two or three weeks. He hadn't been back home more than two or three days when he come down with it, and he got to where he couldn't go at all. He took to his bed and liked to have died despite everything. He thought he was dying one night, but he managed to pull through. He had blisters all over his face the size of quarters, and when he finally got well, them scars stayed with him for years. The doctor wouldn't come in on him when he was down. He'd come to within a hundred yards or so of the house, and he'd holler. I'd go down and get the medicine and take care of Pap, and the doctor never set foot in the house. There was families that had two or three to die, and there was a lot of children that died. It was awful. What type of headstones were used to mark the gravesite? Oh, somebody would just pick up a rock and set it up. They never thought of having any lettering cut on it. Old Lou Trent was the first man I knowed of who had what you call a regular tombstone. They put up a rock at his grave, and it had his name, his date of birth, and all. Why, a lot of people would come down there just to look at that tombstone. They never seen one before. How long after a person died was it before the burial? It depended on the weather. Generally, it was two days, but if it was warm weather, they'd bury them the day after they died. People would gather at the home when somebody died, and they'd take food if they could spare it, and they'd set up all night with the family. Old man Mahoney, he lived up there adjoining us, he got his neck broke and died, and they sat up with him for three nights. I don't know why his wife kept him so long. I helped dig the grave and made the coffin for him. I assume that the coffin was generally not made until after a person died. In other words, no one had a supply of coffins where you could go and choose one as we do now. Oh, no, 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 no. Never thought of looking about a coffin until a person died. Then you'd make the coffin to fit them. Clay Bell's daddy died, and he had a nice coffin made, and they undertook to put him in it, and they couldn't get him in it. It was too little. They had him up two days, and they's kindly in a rush about putting him away. Well, Clay come to me and asked, what are we going to do? We can't get dad in that coffin. I said, you just have to make another one. He asked me if I could make one, and I said, yeah, if I've got the right kind of lumber. How long will it take you, he said. They was a law that you couldn't bury nobody after four o'clock, and it was up in the morning then. Well, I says, if you get the lumber, I can build it in a few hours. He went down to the barn and got out the lumber, and I started planing it down, and I never stopped till I got it done. By the time I finished and we got him in it, it was past three o'clock, but we got him put away before four o'clock. After that, people started coming to me all the time to get me to make coffins. I made coffins for years. There was a maxi boy come up to my place one time to get me to make a coffin for his twin babies. 
He asked me if I'd ever made a twin baby coffin. I said, no, but I can. We went and got the lumber and I made an awful nice coffin. I made it wide at the shoulder and barely sloped it toward the feet. Made it look good. I lined the outside with black cloth and the inside with white cloth. And I got two little cotton pillows for it. I've thought about that a lot. How them two little babies looked laying there in that coffin side by side. Marie Johnson had a set of twins who died when they was a few weeks old. One died one day and one died the next. I made a twin coffin for them. I've made many a coffin. How much would you charge for making one? I never charged a penny in my life for making a coffin because I knowed that one day I was going to have to have one for myself. So that concludes that chapter. The next chapter talks about living off the land, so I'll be really anxious to read that one to you. Another interesting peek into the life of Alex Stewart. The part that we just, that ending part about the burial customs is really interesting on all fronts, but it is another kind of drastic view at how life was then compared to today. I have in my lifetime been with two people when they died, my Papa Wade and my Pap. Pap, my daddy that I talk about so much I was there when both of them died and you know we didn't have to do any of those things that Alex is talking about we called the funeral home uh, called the ambulance called you know the pe the appropriate people and they come and carried them out and they took them to the funeral home and uh, made sure that everything was in order and then they took care of all that so in I mean and I'm glad uh, it's but it is something that um uh, I don't know, it makes you think about, time was just in such different, it was so different in those days, but then you wonder, is that another way that we've kind of lost, we've detached ourselves? I mean, like, was there an honor in, in getting those people ready to be buried, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Maybe are we missing out on that? Although I'm glad, like I said, I'm thankful that, that someone, the day Papa died, that someone, you know, come got him, and, and certainly when Pap died, uh, so that, you know, we were just having such grief that we didn't have to worry about those things that that was kind of all handled away from us of course the other side of it is it keeps funeral homes in in business and all the people that works for them you know it's just a different world that we're living in but i, I found that really fascinating that part and and really more more than fascinating i guess just striking the difference and it's another one of those things that makes you wonder um, although I'm glad that, that I don't have to do that, like I said, with Pap and Papa, but a, another piece of knowledge that's kind of lost, so that if we had to go back to times like that, that would be something, a skill that somebody would have to know, they'd have to learn, they'd have to figure out um, how, to, how to go about those things, like, you know, as horrible as it is to think about, like him talking about the man dying all, all bent up because he was in pain and hurting from the flu. So, just something really really eye-opening and, and really kind of sobering, I guess, to think about. Now, those people that died from the flu, and then him talking about the smallpox, of course, I have no knowledge of anybody having smallpox or anything like that. The that flu epidemic that he's talking about in the 1918, I do have a very fascinating, and I will link to it so you can go hear it, on my, on my blog, Blind Pig and the Acorn, it's a fascinating piece with Cleva Anderson. Cleva lived just down the road from me, kind of over the ridge there where I'm sitting in Pinhook. Um, and I remember her my whole life. Her grandson was a little bit older than me, but went to school with me, and, and I remember her well. Well, I had the opportunity to get a recording of some of the interviews with her that someone, uh, a local man, David Brose, did. And very fascinating, she talks about the flu, when her family got the flu during that. And it's the same as like what Alex is describing, how no one wanted to help because you don't want it either. You ha have to imagine in those days, that was the first time families had ever seen anything like that. They had ever you know, suffered with something that was so devastating that it, in some cases it killed entire families. So it's a real heartwarming story though. She tells even where the, her daddy, where he thinks that he got the flu, where he picked it up and he brought it back home and they all had it, the whole house. But how their neighbors, one of their neighbors come and, and they even tried to say, don't come in. We don't, cause they didn't want to be responsible for him being sick uh, and taking it back to his family. And he was like, you know, no, I have no choice. I have to do what's right, and that's to help you. And then I think uh, someone else in their family come and helped. And anyway, they nursed them back to health. But um, it's a really interesting interview, kind of a first-hand account of those times, just like Alex was given in the book here. 
the first part of the book where he talks starts out talking about fox hunting. I really liked that. I've never been fox hunting, but I've heard so many stories of my Papa Wade of him going fox hunting when he was young. And Pap said that's what all the men, just like what Alex described, they didn't really hunt the fox. They just liked to go up in the woods, up in the mountains, and they'd have a fire, and uh, they'd turn their dogs loose, and then they'd listen to them run. And it was just like a, a form of entertainment for them. But so many stories, comical, heartwarming, all the above, uh, that come from those times, as you might imagine. It, it, you know, today, people might go to a ball game or something like that, but in those days, that they, they, their entertainment was very varied, as we can tell from this chapter where Alex was talking about it. But one of the funny stories there when he was talking about the dogs reminded me that Pap had told me was that it, they were all these local men here, my Pap all Wade and some others were out fox hunting, gathered up around the fire. Well, one of the men had a dog that they were, to, you know, like he said, they tease each other about my dog's better and your dog's this or whatever. And though his prize dog wasn't doing so good that night. And then he ended up, I think he come back to the fire where the men was at. And then they really started ragging him about it, you know, making fun of him. And he said, well, it, I, I'm telling you, it's just because he's getting old and he can't see as good as he used to. You know, he was kind of taken up for his dog. Well, one of the men sitting there while they's all just sitting around talking, I guess got to thinking about that. And so he wanted to be funny. He whittled out while he was sitting there a little pair of glasses, like <laughs> little round glasses, and then put them on the dog and then told the man, you know, now I've got him fixed. I've got him some glasses. So it's just a really humorous story. So um, fun to think about those times. And you can see why they would want to just go out like that and be out in the night together, the camaraderie of the men and the fire, and then listening to the dogs that they loved so much. They loved those dogs. I mean, my Papa Wade had, he it, in my lifetime, not fox hunting, was coon hunting. And he loved his dogs. He took such good care of them. He really loved them. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that part. The interesting part about the tattoo, and that is so interesting, uh, I've read the book before, but I totally forgot about that part. But I love what John Rice is say, says, you know, this is about the second or third time in the book that we've noticed that he, he thinks Alex is wrong and he goes home and researches and finds out he's right. So this is another instance of that. So I, of course, have never heard uh, tattooing called that, making the noise on the uh, string with the rosin. I've, I've obviously read the book before, but I forgot. So that's just fascinating. But it is fascinating, too, that... Um, that they would do that to people. Now, I've read a lot about serenades where when someone got married, they would go to their house and beat on pots and pans and maybe even get the groom out and ride him around and on a rail and, and do various things like that. And also serenading at Christmas, sometimes people would do that. They'd go around and make a lot of noise. Uh, again, thinking of no entertainment, they, ha they had to figure out things to do. But I really think that's interesting. Um, some of the Halloween houses are, that are around, I'm, I'm a chicken, so I can't do any of that kind of stuff, but they should really take that, um, that tip and make them some, some of those strings and then tattoo at, at one of the haunted houses. That would really be a scary sound. There was some kind of little toy, though, and, and some of you probably remember, I've heard that people talk about that their fathers or dad or whatever would make them. And it was like that. It was a little noise maker or more, but it was with a string and you put something on it and then you run something up and down the string. I can't think of it right now, but I'm, I'm sure one of you will think of it. So that's what it reminded me of. Another interesting part about the entertainment was those races, the foot races and the wrestling. Um, I really enjoyed that part. When we were kids, we were always racing each other and um, seeing how far we could jump and you know, we'd come up with all kinds of different things to do to our skills to see who was the best. But I really liked that part and that image of them. Now, the wrestling, we would say wrestling, <laughs> that's interesting too. When um, I was young, boys were wrestling a lot. Sometimes I remember some of my best memories was Pap, and of course he wasn't doing it in a serious way, but he would wrestle, that's what he called it, with Paul in the floor when Paul was little, uh, just really tumbling around, laughing and, and cutting up and stuff, but they called it wrestling, like, you want to wrestle? I'll wrestle you. So uh, I liked that part of um, Alex, too, of his story. So much of this I identify with, even though it's so many years past. Uh, there's so many things, probably from growing up with Pap and Granny, who really taught me about the old ways. Maybe that's why. Maybe I'm just an old soul. I know that's true. I am an old soul. But so many parts of it that I really identify and makes me think of things like Pap and Paul wrestling, wrestling for fun.
So I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you and, and what you enjoyed. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday so we can see what happens to Alex next. Like I said, I think it's going to be about gardening, so I'm really anxious to read that with you.